you're there, say amen. 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 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You may be seated. Thank you, God. What we've read about is a very famous uh, passage of scripture. A lot of people talk about grieving the Holy Spirit quite often. Uh, it's a famous saying, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Be careful not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, there are different beliefs on what exactly it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. Probably the most famous uh, belief about grieving the Holy Spirit is what most of uh, what for the most part Pentecostals and Charismatics cling to the idea that grieving the Holy Spirit is uh, is to deny the operation of spiritual gifts. That's what some people say it means to grieve the Holy Ghost, to deny the continuation of things like the gift of discernment, wisdom, prophecy, knowledge, and tongues. And some say to reject these gifts is actually the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And there are many other different beliefs on what exactly it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. As I was, uh, as I was going through these notes last night, uh, the Holy Spirit revealed to me some things that I've never taken too much time to think about. This, this passage of scripture uh, it's not about some Pentecostal distinctive. In other words, it's not about uh, it's not about what the Holy Spirit does. It's about who He is. And, Amen. and today we're going to be talking about grieving the Holy Spirit. And won't you pray with me, please, Heavenly Father, God? Once again, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us, God. Lord, I ask that you maintain the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in this house. God, I ask that you anoint my lips, that I may minister what you have me say, and anoint each of us to be open to your word. As I minister what your word says to us this morning, God, we trust in you, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. We say it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Context is key. We've all heard that phrase many times in many different situations. Context is key. Um, there are many passages of scripture. The Bible is full of verses that infamously are taken out of context quite often. Uh, there are many Bible verses you see on calendars, on birthday cards and graduation cards, anniversary cards. Uh, verses that sound good on their own and are good verses to read uh, but what we can do with the Bible sometimes is that we can turn it into kind of a stamp and in the moment sticker and not much else um, and there's more to the word of God than just the aesthetic pleasure of putting a verse on something and, and considering that thing that you put it on to be Christian uh, for example one verse that you see constantly, um, especially in the Christian world, is Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Powerful verse, and a verse that you need to remind yourself of daily. Uh, what people can do when you take a verse so precious and you kind of just put it on whatever you want it to go. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but if all the Bible becomes to you is just a t-shirt or just a tattoo or just a birthday card, we can water down what the Holy Spirit wants us to know Amen. when we limit the Bible to stuff like that. Amen. 
Philippians 4.13 was written by a man who was in a very impossible situation. And from that impossible situation, he says, I can do all things through Christ. And around that verse, it's only made more clear what he's talking about. He's talking about being content in any situation. Hallelujah. Uh, whether I'm a free man out on the streets, whether I'm literally in chains, as Paul was when he wrote the book of Philippians, I can be content throughout all of it. Paul knew what it was like to be popular, and he knew what it was like to be wealthy, and he knew what it was like to be not popular and despised for the gospel's sake, and he knew what it was like to be dirt poor. He had been through every area of life that you can think about, and he said, I have learned to be content in every situation because I have a treasure that the world just doesn't have. I have Jesus. Hallelujah. I can do all things through him Hallelujah. who strengthens me. And another Bible verse we see often, uh, and you got to understand, when I talk about taking a verse out of context, I'm literally just talking about that. I'm not talking about when somebody takes a Bible verse and they use it to support something that that verse isn't meant to support. It's literally when you just look at the verse by itself and you don't consider the, the circumstances that it was written in. Another verse where people do this often, and we know about it, Jeremiah 29, 11, probably one of the most famous verses, at least in the Old Testament, uh, for I know the plans that I have for you, says God, plans of good, not of evil, to give you a hope, uh, a future, and expect it in. And it's a word of encouragement. It shows us God's faithfulness. And it's a good verse for sure. And these verses are for you and I to read. They're for you and I to be edified by. God put these things in the Bible for his people. These verses are your verses. They are verses that God has made for you. They're for you. You are the Bible's audience. God wants you to take these verses and take them for what they're worth. And we all know that they're worth a lot. But we need to understand why they were written to begin with. And a major way that we can tell that is by looking at the context. Circumstance affects meaning. It doesn't mean that meaning is uh, fully determined by circumstances, but the meaning of the text is always impacted by the circumstance that it was written in. Anybody can say in any situation, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but whenever you know that that was first written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by a man who was unjustly put in prison, suddenly it becomes more valuable because you first hear it from a man who's going through a very, uh, very difficult time. Uh, how would you like it if you were put into federal prison for a crime that you did not even commit or for a crime that should not even be a crime? The gospel should not be criminal, but it was in Rome when Paul was alive. But from a situation that was literally beyond his control, uh, from a situation where he had literally zero say in what happened to him there in the moment at least, he says, I can do all things through Christ. Suddenly when you learn about why it was written and who wrote it, you understand the weight that it has to it because of the context. Uh, Jeremiah 29 11, 29, 11 that verse, that chapter, was literally written to a people who were under God's judgment in that moment. As it was written, when they received it, the people of Judah were in the midst of judgment. God was judging those people for their sin. And Jeremiah says, on behalf of God, I know the plan. So even in the midst of his wrath against his own people, God still remembered his mercy. It's not a verse about being promoted at my job. It's not a verse about me uh, having, a, 
having a good day at work or in my house. It's not about me just getting whatever I want. It's a verse that shows how faithful God actually is. And Amen. It's a verse that shows me that God could literally look at a group of people that he is judging and still be rich in mercy to those people. Yes. It shows me the Thank faithfulness you, of my God. Hallelujah. Context is very important. Yes. It's important to know the circumstances of, and the surrounding text and of all of these things that are written in. And I bring that up uh, for obvious reasons uh, when it comes to what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. A lot of people will read a verse and they just assume that they know what it means. And in their own understanding, they jump to conclusion. And that's just the, the way that they think that they can understand the Bible. Uh, well, uh, as far as I know, I think it means what it says. People will say things like that. And the Bible always means what it says but the problem with that is that we don't always know exactly what the bible is saying Amen. there's a big deal of the bible that you cannot understand without the help of the holy spirit Amen. there's a reason why you have to be dependent on god and teach you the bible personally because in and of yourself in and of myself we can't understand the bible at least the way that god wants us to understand it we need this to be taught to us you and i are learning christ and we're in the process of learning godliness and holiness and how to apply that to our lives so you and i wouldn't know what god wanted us to know with an improper understanding of the context of these books, and the Holy Spirit helps with that. The Holy Spirit puts everything into perspective. He helps you out with all of that. The Holy Spirit helps, but we have the responsibility to act on the grace and the ability that he gives us. What did Paul say to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So yes, the Holy Spirit helps, and you and I have a responsibility to accept that help and actually look at the word of God for ourselves through his perspective. You and I have a responsibility to study the Bible and understand it the way that God wants us to understand it. So considering all of that, Looking at the context of our text today, uh, what exactly has been going on in Ephesians 4 up to now? Well, Paul has been discussing what a Christian should not be like. For about the second half of this chapter, as we've been going through it throughout these past however many weeks, we've been looking at what a Christian should not look like. That's about what the second half of Ephesians 4 is dedicated to. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, is explaining to you and I what a Christian should not be like. The kind of characteristics that a child of God should not have. It's easy to understand, yes, you should be loving, you should be forgiving. That is scripture, that is biblical. But you also need to be told up front that you should not be unforgiving. If God didn't tell you to not be unforgiving, and if all you and I were told is to just be forgiving, many people would take that natural ignorance, that, that uh, lack of instruction to not be unforgiving, and they would look for leverage to be unforgiving. If God did not straight up clarify himself, do not be unforgiving. Do not harbor unforgiveness. So when it comes to you knowing what a Christian life looks like, you need to be told who to be, and you and I need to be told who not to be at the same time. Yes, amen. And both of these complement one another. It's for your benefit. Yes. It's right. for your spiritual growth. Hallelujah. Because God has the best in mind for you. We know that based off of what Ephesians 4 has told us, that a Christian shouldn't lie, but instead a Christian should be honest. A Christian shouldn't sin out of anger, nor should we hold on to anger. We shouldn't hold on to wrath that we have against somebody else. 
We know that a Christian shouldn't steal, but instead have an honest living that glorifies God and benefits others. We know that a Christian shouldn't communicate in any corrupt fashion, and that phrase, corrupt communication, it includes swearing, it includes gossip, it includes slander, it includes lying, it includes any ungodly means of speaking at all. It's perfectly generic, not specific, just whatever comes to mind that would be corrupt in the eyes of God. Paul says, don't let any of that come out of your mouth. But instead, uh, but instead communicate that which is good, that which is godly, for the edification of others, both non-believers and believers alike. Uh, what Paul has been doing in a nutshell is he's been describing what we call today the sanctification process. Uh, the process where God separates you from the world, from, the, from your flesh, from the devil, and he separates you unto himself. Uh, that separation process, sanctification, that's what he's been describing in a very, very hands-on, very practical way. It's one thing if I can just stand up here and tell you, you're saved by the cross and you're sanctified by the cross. Don't just depend on Jesus for your salvation. Trust him for your sanctification. And I could use that word left and right all day. But there comes a point when you and I have to know what that actually looks like. Yes, we know that God wants to sanctify us, but what exactly does he want to sanctify us from? Amen. And what does he want to sanctify us to? Yes. There's a big... Larry, you're looking at me with one eye open. You all right there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, was it something I said? No. <laughs> but we need to know what that actually looks like. It's important that you know what godliness actually looks like because... In, just think about it. Anybody can just get up here and say, God wants you to live a godly life. Well, everybody knows that. Every Christian knows that God wants you to be godly. But it's important, and the Holy Spirit shows it to us, what godliness actually looks like. What a godly lifestyle actually is on a practical level. The blood of Jesus affects your lifestyle. And you get a first uh, I guess you could say you get a very direct glance into what that kind of lifestyle looks like here in Ephesians 4. Uh, throughout this Christian life, you are being sanctified. You are in a process. This process began the moment that you got saved. Amen. In other words, sanctification happens where salvation happened at the cross of Calvary. Yes, it's you. all the same source of strength. The same Jesus who saved you is the same Jesus mm -hmm. who sanctifies yes, you. Yes, The Lord same Jesus name. who renewed your soul is the same Jesus that renews your mind. Hallelujah. It's the same Jesus that renews your mouth. Yes. It's the same God. Jesus, and it's the same strength. <clears throat> Jesus talks about a well that never runs dry. That well is himself. Oh, yeah. That well is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is pointing you to that well. Every minute of every day, you are being sanctified. You're being separated from the world and the flesh Hallelujah. and the devil. And you're being separated to God. So when you think of the word grieve, the first thing that comes to mind naturally, you think about somebody mourning for usually somebody who has recently deceased. A recently deceased loved one. Many people find themselves in grief, uh, in a season of grief, after somebody that they love very much has passed away. And this could be a friend, it could be a family member, but in the original Greek language, the word for grief, as it's used here in Ephesians 4, it means to cause grief to somebody. The way that this word is used here, it doesn't just speak about somebody who's grieving over a loss. This word refers to somebody who is the reason for somebody else's grief. In other words, the word literally means to offend. It means to cause offense to somebody else. 
So when he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, he speaks of you and I causing offense to the third person of the Godhead. And people hear that and they think, well, how could God be offended? He's God. He knows everything. Uh, don't you think it would be a little petty for somebody so powerful to be offended? And to that, I just want to say this. God is God. He's not a man that he should repent. That's what the Bible says. But he is a God of emotion. And he expresses his emotions very clearly. He's not controlled by his emotions, and nobody should be. But God is an emotional God. He makes it known when he's happy. He makes it known when he's joyful. He makes it known when he's angry. He makes it known when he is grieved. He doesn't hide it from anybody when he is sad, when he is angry, when he is joyful. So the fact that God has emotions, the fact that you have emotions, it doesn't automatically make you insecure. What would be insecure is that if you allowed your emotions to dictate your thoughts. If you allowed your emotions to make your decisions for you, that would be insecure. God is not like that. You can be emotional and stable at the same time. And there is literally nobody that you know who is a better example of that kind of a person than God himself. Amen. So yes, God does have emotions, and he's not ashamed to let you know what he's feeling there in the moment. So yes, it is very possible for the Holy Spirit to be grieved. It's possible for the Holy Spirit to be offended. It doesn't make him weak or insecure. It just means that he can be offended. And Paul says in this text, don't offend the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So to grieve in this sense, it's to cause grief, literally to offend the Holy Ghost. Um, what Paul, if you were to summarize everything that Paul has been saying, in this second half of Ephesians, up to this point, he basically is saying this. Embrace the sanctification process and don't offend God while you're at it. Embrace what God wants to do in your life. Don't be an offense to the Lord while you yes, live Pastor. this Christian life. Yes, so that brings Praise the question God. that many people naturally want to ask. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? We know that it means to offend the Holy Spirit, but how do you do that? How do you grieve God exactly? How does that happen? Well, first of all, you have to ask yourself, what is the Holy Spirit's mission in your life? What's the Holy Spirit's goal for the Christian in the Christian life? And I don't do this often, but I want all of you to go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John. Uh, quickly turn to John chapter 14. Here for a few chapters, Jesus teaches here a little and there a little about the Holy Spirit and what he does for the Christian. And when you get to John chapter 14, I want you to look at verses 16 and 17. Jesus says this, John 14, verses 16 and 17, he says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and shall be in you. Hallelujah. So from those two verses, there are a few things that we already know about the person of the Holy Spirit and how he affects your life. We know that the Holy Spirit will abide with you forever. You're never going to lose him. Uh, as long as you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit is right there with you. Yes, He's I not am. distant from you. He never leaves you behind. Uh, and even, when, even in those little moments when you'd rather he not be there, he's still there. He will never, ever leave you, and he will be with the child of God forever. Yes. That Hallelujah. means even when you get into heaven, his presence will still be yes. right there with you. The Holy Spirit is an eternal spirit, eternal in a personal way. 
He's God. He is eternal, obviously, but personally, he'll always be with you. We know that he will only reveal the truth to you. We know that God is not a liar. He will never tell us that which is false. So even if it's something that offends us, we know that it's the truth. He'll, he'll only tell the truth to you. We know that the world cannot receive him. The Holy Ghost is exclusively for the child of God. There does not exist a Christian right now that does not have the Holy Spirit. And there does not exist a lost person right now who has the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you have the person of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Amen. And if you're lost, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can't say that God regularly communicates with you in a way that the Bible only says he does with his children if you don't even know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to begin with. The Holy Spirit is the church's spirit. It's the Christian's spirit. He is your spirit. He is for the child of God. He only dwells in God's people. And now go ahead and skip down with me to verses 26 and 27. Jesus says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So from those two verses, we know the Holy Spirit's mission is to strengthen your faith. Uh, or I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit's mission is to strengthen your faith in Jesus. But in verses 26 and 27 of this chapter, we know the Holy Spirit reveals to you the truth. He reveals the depth and the value of God's word on a very personal level. He is literally your personal Bible teacher. Uh, you only get Sister Jan for one hour, one day every week. You get the Holy Spirit 24 hours a day, seven yeah. days a week. Glory. So Hallelujah. you only get our pastor uh, a few hours out of the week, depending on what you need him for. You have the Holy Ghost all day, every day. Yeah. Um, he is literally attached to you, Hallelujah. all right, spiritually. So we know that he causes you to remember scripture you've already read when you need to know it. And many times we've been in those situations where we needed a bit of wisdom there in that moment. All of a sudden, that verse that we haven't thought about in months just comes to mind. And it deals with exactly what we're dealing with yes, there in that situation. Thank you, Lord. Thank That's you, the Holy Spirit causing you to remember Praise what God. you've learned. So even if you weren't planning on bringing to your own mind the Word of God and that verse from that book in that moment, the Holy Spirit brought it to you. Amen. And that's, one, that's, that's what he's supposed to do. He's the maintainer of peace for the Christian. Every bit of peace you've ever felt as a child of God, it was given by Christ. Christ calls it his peace in this chapter. But it was handled, it was catered, it was maintained by the Holy Spirit. Every minute of every day, it was the Holy Spirit who personally maintained that peace for you. So every time that you've ever gone through a situation as a child of God, and there was just this peace, you didn't understand the situation, you didn't know why you were going through, what it was that you were going through, you just knew God in that situation, and that was good enough. Amen. The Holy Spirit was the one that maintained and catered that peace of God to you. That peace, Paul said again in Philippians, I think it was chapter 4, that surpasses all understanding. Yes, that hallelujah. was made real to you Amen. by the Holy Ghost. Now go ahead and look at chapter 15 of the book of John, and let's look at verses 26 and 27 of this chapter. Jesus says, When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. 
and you also shall, shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I did say chapter 15, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Y'all are in chapter 15, okay. Yeah. So from those two verses, we know that it's the Holy Spirit. His mission is to strengthen your faith in Christ. Jesus said that he will testify of me. Uh, if you've never received this big new revelation about the Holy Spirit that nobody else knows about, it's because the Holy Spirit hasn't made it his personal mission to just make your Christian life all about him. He's important, and we respect his presence and his power in our lives, but we honor him the more we seek the knowledge of Christ and him crucified. Amen. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to make a reality to you all day, every day, growing in the knowledge and in the faith of, of the person of Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished for you at the cross of Calvary. Amen. The Holy Spirit speaks of Christ. He, he wants to see your faith strengthened in Christ. Yes. He wants to see you more dependent on Christ oh, every yeah. day, every, of day. every year of your life. Every day. The Holy Spirit wants to glorify Christ in your life personally, not just in a corporate church setting like this, but to you personally. Mm -hmm. On the job, when you're at your house with your family, uh, when you're at lunch at Subway or McDonald's, whatever, the Holy Spirit wants to glorify Christ uh, to you. Amen. So we know that he wants to do that. He gives the believer strength to share the gospel with others. I've heard stories many times where somebody is nervous to tell somebody else about Jesus. But then they start talking, and it's like they can't shut up. Yeah. That's the strength that the Holy Ghost gives Amen. to God's people when we witness. And it could only ever come from Him. Because some of us, we, we feel like a nervous wreck before we start telling somebody. But then we start talking, and it's like, we, it's like we've trapped the poor soul. Uh, they're not leaving the conversation until we're done talking to them. That's the strength. That's the equipping that the Holy Spirit does. Tell other people about Jesus. You, uh, you being anxious and you being nervous to tell people about Jesus is never a good enough excuse because many people are nervous, many people are anxious. Yes, but the Holy Spirit gives you that strength. It's not your strength mm -hmm. that you're depending on. It's God's strength yes, operating God. through you. God. So now go ahead and look at John chapter 16. I want you to look at verse 8. I'm going to read. 8 through 14 here. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged, that refers to Satan, he is judged, and the Holy Ghost makes that known to you whenever you feel condemned that your adversary is an adversary doomed for judgment. Yes, Verse number is. 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you of sin. And it's a good thing to be convicted of sin. Conviction is not condemnation. The Holy Spirit never aims to trap you in the guilt of your sin. Conviction, it's literally correction, as Sister Jan said today, to get you back on the right path. Yeah. To get you back into the right mindset. With conviction, there's always a way out of guilt that your sin brings to you. And with conviction, it's a discipline that leads you to embrace that sanctification process. Conviction is a tool so God can lead you to walk in that sanctifying power of the blood of Jesus. He glorifies Christ in your life. And what you receive from him is no different than what the Father or the Son 
some people, and they're usually lost, people who talk like this, people will say, well, I just need the words of Jesus. I don't need the rest of the New Testament because, you know, who needs the rest of the New Testament when you got the words of Jesus and the four Gospels? Everything you get from the Holy Spirit for the rest of the New Testament is no different than what Jesus himself would tell you Amen. if he were the one speaking. It's no different than what the Father would tell you if he were the one to say it. The Trinity is in perfect union. Amen. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I and my Father are one. There's never a disagreement on what to say, how to say it, what to do, how to do it. Um, whenever Jesus went to that cross, it was the Father who sent him. It was Christ who offered himself as your sacrifice. And it was the Holy Ghost who led him to Golgotha's hill to pay the price for your sins. The Godhead is never at odds with one another. You and I serve one God in spirit. And we see that unity testify of the fact that we don't serve three different gods. That's, this isn't like Greek mythology where you can have one God who believes one way, another God who believes no, no, no. You and I serve one God in spirit. So, what you receive from the Holy Spirit, the words of the Holy Spirit that the apostles and the disciples, all these men get in the New Testament, it is the words of Christ. The it's no different than what Jesus wants you to know. It's no different. When you read the word of God, regardless of who is speaking, whether it's the Father, whether it's the Son, whether it is the Holy Ghost, when you read the word of God, church, you get the word of God. One way or another, it's God's word. Everywhere you look, every verse you read, it is the word of God. So now I'm going to ask that you jump back to Ephesians 4 with me. And all things considered with what we just looked at with the Holy Spirit, we know that the Holy Spirit will reflect the will of the entire Trinity. There's no confusion on what God wants for you, who God wants you to be, what God wants you to do. When you read the New Testament, you wouldn't hear anything else that Christ himself would tell you. And of all of the people you want to offend, God is the last of those. So, in verse 30, Paul says, uh, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And you are sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. And that day of redemption speaks of the day where you and I basically receive our glorified bodies. It speaks of our glorification. It speaks of when we spend eternity with God after this life here on earth. The, our day of redemption that draws nigh, that draws near, that the Bible talks about, that day of redemption. And that means that even though you live in a mortal body, a body that is affected by sin, uh, the Holy Spirit seals you for that day of redemption. You're not a lost cause just because you're not perfect. The Holy Spirit, as it says here, is your seal. He is your protection. And the way that the Word of God uses that word seal, it's a seal of approval in the eyes of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit is presented here in verse 30 as a sign of approval on behalf of the Christian in the eyes of God. And it means that there is no disagreement between what the Christian is. Okay, how do I put this? So it basically means that you're not at risk of losing your salvation because of your struggles or your failures or the temptations that you and I once in a while do succumb to. It means that God's protection over your life is not so fragile to the point that you lose your salvation just because you have a wrong thought in your mind. In order for a Christian to lose their salvation, they would literally have to remove their faith from Christ right. and put it into something else. That's it's right. not because of failure. It's not because of sin, uh, because we know that God's strength is far greater than our sin. Yes. Grace that Hallelujah. is greater than our sin. Thank you, Lord. We sing about it and we believe 
what we sing about. So from the moment you got saved until the end of eternity, literally that long, and according to what Jesus says in John 14, uh, eternity, eternal life is literally a relationship with God. That's how he defines eternal life in John chapter 14. He says that they may know you, speaking to the Father, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Your eternal life is your relationship with God and church forever. That's a relationship that's built to last forever, that God intends to last forever. The Holy Ghost will be with you forever. Um, I hear stories all the time, and you hear these stories as well, of when soldiers go out to war and they go out to battle against whoever. Uh, I've heard of these stories from people who fought in World War II, Vietnam, the Middle East, and wherever we were at, you hear this same story constantly of that bond that these men um, get with their fellow soldiers, that brotherhood that grows. And given the circumstances, you could see how there would be a close bond there because they're literally fighting with one another. Whether or not somebody lives to the end of the day is very dependent on everybody else in their team. And even whenever they come home from the war, there's always this attempt to regroup with your battle buddies, with the guys that you fought in war with, because that bond is just matchless. There's really nothing like it. And it's the same story every generation from war you could think of if they were in Korea. It's the same story you hear all the time about that relationship between a soldier and the men that he personally fought with during that time of war. We always hear that story from these kinds of people. Well, Paul said to Timothy that he fought a good fight of faith. You and I are in a fight. It's not a fight against the devil. Uh, it's not a fight against the world per se. It's a fight to keep our faith planted in Christ. Yes, it's a fight that our faith remain grounded yes. in the finished work oh of God's God. Son. Yes. You and I are in a good fight. And the Holy Spirit is your battle buddy. The Holy Spirit is literally the best friend of the Christian. Yes. The Holy Spirit is your best friend and most trusted ally in this life. In this good fight of faith, the Holy Ghost has your back all day, every day. The closest, most intimate aspect of your relationship with God can be found in your daily walk with the Holy Spirit. Charles Spurgeon would have this to say about verse 30. He says this, he, speaking of the Spirit, he is not a God who reigns in solitary isolation, divided by a great gulf, but he, the blessed Spirit, comes into such near contact with us, takes such minute observation, feels such tender regards, that he can be grieved by our faults. God is not waiting on you to take your relationship with him seriously before he takes it seriously as well. As far as he is concerned, he takes you and I seriously, regardless of our own devotion. Yes, thank you. Hallelujah. So, can we say the same thing about our end of this relationship? God takes you seriously, regardless of what you feel about him. Regardless of how much time you give for the Holy Spirit to work in your life, God is going to take you as seriously today as he did yesterday, as he did the day you got mm -hmm. saved. That is never changing. But how seriously do I take this relationship oh. with the Holy Spirit? This is the observation that Paul is asking me to give myself in verse 30. How seriously do I take my relationship? How submissive am I to his work in my life? Who am I in this relationship? 
often, and my mother, she's been teaching for just over a decade now, I believe, and she can probably tell you the same thing. There are many times when you will spend hours putting a class together for a specific class, and, uh, and they're kids, so you can't be too mad, you can't be just aggravated, but there are days where you will spend hours after school is already done and you're free to go home, you will stay at the school spending hours sometimes putting everything together just for the next day so that your students could have a smooth class so that everything runs accordingly. And then the kids come the next day and uh, it's like everything you set up that day is just derailed whether it's because of bad behavior, whether it's because of something else happening. And in the moment, it could be a little hurtful, especially uh, for a first year teacher. It could be hurtful whenever you have to experience that, especially the first time. Whenever you devote so much of your time and your energy just so somebody else could have a good day and they just don't take advantage of what given to them at all. They don't appreciate your hard work. They don't do any of that. I do not want to hear the stories of how often that man sitting right there has poured his life into somebody else just so they could live to see another day and they never even acted like he existed to begin with. Amen. There are pastors all over this world that go through that neglect weekly. And it's natural to be neglectful of the people who want to help you, uh, but that doesn't make it a good thing, to be honest. Do you and I treat the Holy Spirit that way with such a disregard for how much time he pours into you? And it's a constant thing. It's not like a teacher or even like a pastor. This is God. Every minute of your day, he has his eye on you. He pays very close attention. He searches your heart constantly, constantly, constantly. So what gratitude do I have for the Holy Spirit exactly? It's just a question. Uh, it's not condemning anybody. It's a question that Paul is asking. It's a question the Holy Spirit is asking to this day. And it's a question that you and I have to ask ourselves. Uh, so Jesus defines eternal life in John 17, 3. I got it wrong earlier. It was in John 17. It's in John 17. He defines it in John 17 as a relationship with God. That's where he defines it. Uh, that's where he defines eternal life uh, in John 17, 3. It's literally a relationship with God. Speaking to the Father, he says, This is eternal life that they know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's it. In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul calls the Holy Ghost the earnest of our inheritance. And that means that the biggest benefit of our salvation is literally the presence of God in our lives. That's the biggest benefit you have as a child of God, is the constant presence of the Holy Spirit in your day-to-day -day life. You want to know what that means? It means that your relationship with God is more important than you just going somewhere when you die one day. Amen. Your relationship with God right now is more important than you moving from one realm to another one day. Whether it's by rapture or whether it's by the grave, it's a good thing to go to heaven. But here's the thing, every Christian is going to heaven. Every saved person is going to heaven. They're on their way to heaven right now. No Christian, and I don't say this to be crude, it's just the truth, though. No Christian is special because they're on their way to heaven. All of God's people are going to heaven. Everybody who has placed their faith in Christ for their salvation, they will go to heaven when they leave this world. But you know what not every Christian can say about themselves is that they actually value consistently this relationship. Not every child of God can say that because 
many Christians have put this distance between them and the Holy Spirit for one reason or another. Whether it's because they don't want to do what God wants them to do, I don't know. Whether they were offered a job that wasn't really of God and they ignored the conviction of the Holy Spirit and took the job anyways because of a bigger pay, I have not a clue. But many Christians all over the world, they put this distance between them and the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, they just don't really, Bob Cornell put it this way, they become miserably saved. Miserably saved. They get to heaven, but they're basically crawling past the finish line. Miserably saved. All because of that distance that they put there. God does not distance himself from you. You distance yourself from God. Amen. Yeah. God would, why would God ever distance himself Amen. from anybody? So again, it's not just a statement to condemn anybody. It's a call to evaluate our actual walk with God. Your relationship with God is more valuable <laughs> to God than you just going to heaven one day. And given the context of Ephesians 4, Paul seems to uh, consider grieving the Holy Spirit to be this. All right, so judging by what Paul says in Ephesians 4, this is what it seems to be to grieve the Holy Spirit, living a lifestyle that neglects the new covenant. Living a lifestyle that is anti-Bible. And you got to keep in mind, he's not talking to lost people in this book. He's talking to Christians, the Ephesians. They are saved. He's writing to the Ephesian church. So living a lifestyle that neglects the new covenant. And when you just think about it, the Holy Spirit wants the new covenant to be your lifestyle. Everything you read about in the, in the Bible, about godly living, about what a Christian should say, what a Christian shouldn't say, the Holy Spirit wants to make that a reality to you. He wants to give you the strength to do it, the wisdom to do it, and throughout all of it, your faith in Christ being the main reason that you can do all of this yes, stuff. Hallelujah. And to look at the new covenant life yes. as a Christian and to be so lackluster about everything, I could see. I can also see how some would define grieving the Holy Spirit as rejecting the uh, continuation of the gifts. And I get that, but you, you got to consider there are Baptists right now who have never spoken in tongues a day in their life, and they are far more committed to the spreading of the gospel than many Pentecostals and Charismatics that I know. To grieve the Holy Spirit is to live the life he's not giving you. Johnny, did you have something to say? Yes. Uh, we're saying that Christians in a lot of faith that if a job comes along and, and uh, we, we're worried about our faith in that job, if we take that job for a better pay, the, the money would mean the money wouldn't mean as much as salvation. If you if you were to take that job
It can be summed up in these six things that Paul talks about in verse 31. Um, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. For those of you who don't know, clamor is kind of a racket, aggressive, violent noise, usually raised out of spite. Paul says, do away with that. Uh, often, especially in America today, if somebody has a disagreement with you, they will get fierce for some reason, and they will yell at you for no good reason.
He wants you to see Christ. And mm -hmm. not just Jesus, but he wants you specifically to have a specific view of who Jesus is. Yes, hallelujah. He wants Jesus to be better for you than any other option that you have in this world. Before you go and uh, take medication for anything, and I'm not anti-medication, it has its place, doctors have their place in this world, Luke was a physician, I'm not criticizing any of that, I'm literally just saying, the Holy Spirit wants your faith to be resting in Christ for your healing, far above your dependence in anything else, Amen. Yes. and that is applied to every area of area of your life. Yes. So, let's give that care and attention that God gives to us back to Him. Amen. Let's give that attention back to the Lord. In other words, let's be a church that operates like a church. Hallelujah. Let's be Christians who live like Christians. Amen. Amen. I'm going to get a little personal now with you, and it's not me specifically as much as it is us. Uh, myself included but I've seen and I've heard it said many times in this church and I'm there with you that we need to prepare for more people coming to this church and I believe in God for more people I believe in God for more families just like everyone else at this church uh, when that happens and I say when because I'm believing for it just like we all are when that happens when they start to come in, there's a standard that we do have to meet for them. Not in light of what we think about each other, but in light of what the Bible says about Amen. Christians. Yes, hallelujah. It is, uh, and I'm as thankful for my home church as anyone else. But once in a while, again, just being transparent with you, there were times where I heard something from some people in this church that I couldn't agree with. Not doctrinally, nothing doctrinal wise, but I'll never forget uh, one time somebody was coming to this church for a while and after long enough they left and they go to another church somewhere now, uh, whatever, I don't really know a lot about their life now. All I know is that this person, and it wasn't just them, but this person came to this church for a while, and then after a while, they ended up leaving. Well, the week after they left, I started telling everybody, well, this person, they, they've left. I think they're going to go to somewhere else now. And somebody who is a regular uh, member of this church, or, yeah, uh, yeah, somebody who's a regular member of this church, um, said something about this individual that was just ungodly and I don't judge anybody when I say that I'm literally just telling you what happened and it was it was borderline slander what I heard this person say and if that's the kind of church that all of these new people that we're believing for are going to come to who's to say they can't leave as quickly as they come in Amen. you and I individually. That man right there cannot make you a godlier person as much as that lady sitting right there. This is between you and God. Right. You and I individually have a responsibility to give God that attention that he needs. Not that he's just a helpless lost cause without your attention. Literally because it benefits your character it benefits how you live your life. The more you give your time to the Holy Spirit, the more dedication you give to this walk with God, the further those spiritual roots go into the finished work of Christ, talking about your faith, the deeper your faith goes into Christ and what he did at the cross for you. All of that shows, it shows, it shows in how you live, it shows in how you talk, not just in general, but how you talk about other people. I was very dissatisfied when I heard what I heard that one uh, Sunday where that person said that thing about that other person. And I'm right there with you.
with you. I believe that we should be seeking God for more people. Uh, no church ever went to hell for having a lot of people go going to it. I get that, but it matters the kind of church that we are. Amen. The kind of church that we are when they get here. Amen. It does matter. As unsatisfying as it may or may not be to hear, you don't get a say in what your Christianity looks like. Amen. You either live like a Christian or you literally don't. Amen. Well, I wish I knew who that person was. I'd have a little talk with them. So, Bless him, Lord. Well, I know you will. It was Larry. No, I'm just kidding. It was Larry. <laughs>